video on the milling machine, you may recall that I didn't get very much tooling for it, apart from things like shell mill holders. I got quite a few in different sizes, and the only other thing that came with it is the ER25 collet chuck. One of those shell mill holders did come in handy for a face mill, but other than the collet chuck, I don't have very much for the mill, at least compared to what I had for the bridge port in terms of R8 tooling. I don't have tooling for a small drill chuck. I do have one for the larger drill chuck. I'm missing tooling for my slitting saws, and I thought it'd be handy to build permanent end mill holders for my insert end mills. I've actually already made one. This is for the three quarter inch. I've got a half inch and a three eighths that I'd also like to put in dedicated tooling. I've had this piece of chromoly in the racks waiting for that special something, and I think these arbors might be it. This is a 50 CR M04. I believe that's a 4150. Now, I won't be heat treating this. I mean, I could send it out for heat treat once I'm done, but unfortunately, I don't really have any means of grinding after those come back. I could actually probably get away grinding the taper. It's short enough, and I would have more than likely a cylindrical feature of some kind to hold on to in the surface grinder, but then I'd have no way to flip it around or grind the ID of this tooling, which is much more critical than the OD. But I've decided to go with this stuff because on paper, at least, it appears to be a little bit tougher, a little bit harder than your standard 1030 or 1040 cold rolled steel. And in fact, working it in the lathe in the mill, that appears to be true. It's, it's some weird stuff. We'll see this a little bit later, but I'm getting chips that are uh, almost like a stainless maybe, but they're kind of soft and floppy for how hard the material is. And I, I pushed my lathe to almost a 70 thou depth of cut and I still couldn't get these chips to break. So let's just take a quick tour of what's involved here. Mine happen to be International 30 tapers. I think all of these operations are probably identical for any type of machine tooling you might have. This one has the International 30 taper, of course. I've got a 12 millimeter draw bar thread in the back. Whatever the business end might need to look like, just some turning and boring. And then a couple of spots for the spindle dogs. They're actually these. So when this gets pulled up by the draw bar, it locks into dogs in the spindle face. Here's the one I already made for the three quarter inch end mill. It turned out pretty all right. It seats well in the taper. It did get chowdered up a bit. I don't know if that shows up on camera. I had a V-block clamp break on me while I was cutting the dog and it spun and luckily didn't do too much damage. I do like to blue my tooling when I can. I mean, it's nice. It makes it look a little more professional, uh, but I do it mostly for rust prevention, corrosion resistance. I've got some tooling that I've made from quite a few years ago, both with blue and without blue, and the ones that are blued still look like they're new. The ones that weren't, you know, still work fine. They've just got those rusty fingerprints all over them now. So I've decided to make these because as it turns out, International 30 taper tooling isn't that cheap. I mean, it's out there, but it's been a little tough to find. For example, I looked for end mill holders Imperial size end mill holders in a metric International 30 appear to be a bit rare, but if you do find them, they go anywhere from $40 to $80 a pop, depending on the brand and the quality. And when I saw those numbers, you know, that math was easy to do. So I'm going to take this over to the saw, chop off three, maybe four pieces. I'll see what I can get out of here, and I'll batch through them. All right, I got four pieces out of that. It's one for the three-eighths, one for the half-inch. One that's just a little bit longer for the slitting saws, and then a fourth I might mount this small chuck on. So as you can see, the bird nesting factor for this chromoly is pretty high. It's not all that fun to work with. There's a lot of stopping and clearing these things before they get too far out of control. Though I found if I bump the uh, the automatic feed, sort of just give it a little bit of a hiccup to break that chip, I can do a lot more turning before I have a major buildup. 
So I've already roughed out half of three. My insert's starting to spark out, so it's not lasting me very long. So initially my preconception was to turn these between centers just to sort of get as concentric a part as I could, sort of take the chucks and all that kind of stuff out of the equation. But it turns out that really wouldn't have helped much because the critical diameters here are the taper and the inside feature, whatever that happens to be, at least in the case for the tools that I'm making. So at some point I would have had to take it out of the centers and hold it in something else, which sort of defeats the purpose of running it between centers in the first place. So what I'm doing is roughing out the taper side without cutting the taper. Once I get them roughed in, I'm going to chuck them back up and take them to final dimension. These things get very, very hot. And one of the easiest ways to scrap apart is to measure and turn it while it's hot. Because then as soon as it cools down, it'll go right out of spec. Taking them in and out of the three jaw now isn't very critical at all because I still haven't established what will become sort of the, the reference surface. Once these are to size without the taper, I'll flip them in the collet chuck and bring in the business end. I'll leave some amount of cylindrical surface there flip that background in the collet chuck and cut the taper. I wasn't sure how well I would do on concentricity there, but the first one I did, sort of the test holder, turned out pretty darn good. So hopefully these will follow suit. Though I did almost lose one. I don't know if you can see that. It's much smaller. I don't know. Did the math wrong on this one or spaced out. I think I caught it just in time. I mean, it was looking small. This is where the drawbar thread goes. I don't think it's too critical to the function of this tooling, but just to play it safe, I may turn this one into the arbor for the drill chuck because the forces on that are straight up the uh, taper. Again, might not make a difference, but sounds better that way anyway. All right, they're all roughed out. These have cooled down. I'm just going to go back through and take them to final size. Drill and tap 12 millimeter for the draw bar. I left about 50 thou on those diameters, 40 to 50 thou. So I should be well within, you know, what this chuck is capable of. Again, it won't really matter until I turn it around, and that's where the collet chuck comes in. All right, so there they are all taken to size and threaded for the draw bar. Again, the only thing that's missing here now is the taper, but I'm gonna conserve this diameter so I can work this end in the collet chuck. There's the longer one for the slitting saw. I think that's it for today. You guys tune in tomorrow and we'll try to wrap these up. You know, as soon as you start to think about surface finish before you take a cut, it goes south. Lathes can smell fear. Anyway, it doesn't matter because it's going to get blued, but still it would have been nice. So I'm just going to drill and ream to accept this half inch end mill. I'm going to drill it out pretty close to size and then let it cool down a bit before I go in with the reamer. Just in case it doesn't make it into the final edit, I plan to come in here with a small long drill bit and also break that hole all the way through into the draw bar threads just to vent it so I'm not creating a blind hole and it anytime I need to change this end mill, it's like pulling a cork out of a bottle. See how that fits. That's pretty good. I like that. One down, a couple more to go. 
All right, so let me give you the what's what. As I mentioned, they're all roughed out. I was going to cut the taper, but I think I'm going to cut the relief for the keyways for the spindle dogs. On this first one, I cut the taper first, and then that left me just a smaller diameter or a shorter length to hold on to in the vise. So I thought this time I might cut these before I cut the taper and give me a little bit more to hold on to. So you saw the first three. This is the slitting saw holder. Let me grab a saw. So there's just a small step here with a very mild undercut to make sure I had a square corner. And that fits these 22 millimeter saws that I have a few of. There's a counterbore and an eight millimeter thread and I'll make a cap that retains this. Now I may have made this a smidge too long, but it seems like I'm always running out of reach with these saws. So that's that. But the bad news is I lost one. I don't know if you can see down in there. That's the remnants of a drill bit. It's almost half inch in diameter. This was the drilling operation before the reaming was going to happen. It must have just welded itself down in there. It's a bummer. I mean, it's not that much work to get back to here. It's just I have no more of this material left. Now to get that out, I pulled every trick in the book. Heated, cooled it. I had a little bit of a stub sticking out. I welded that to some flat stock. That didn't work. It just broke deeper. I tried to drill this with a carbide drill. Broke my drill. Then I decided to come in through the back. I thought maybe I could drill in and tap it out the other way. Broke another drill down in the bottom there. Like I said, this is some vicious stuff. At any rate, all hope might not be lost. I may just turn this down, reveal more of that drill bit, and hope that it comes out, and then maybe turn this into some other kind of tooling. Not sure what I can do with just a little stub, but maybe I can press fit something else in there and turn it into a second saw arbor. But I'm going to set this aside for now and just keep trucking with the first four. Hey, so before I get into the cutting, I thought I'd just take a, a minute for a quick mill update, if anyone is interested. I did end up substituting the DRO. It's just an import, DRO2, three-axis milling machine from eBay. I haven't torn into the other one yet, but I hope to repurpose the two working axes, if I can't fix all three, on a different machine. The installation of the scales went pretty smoothly. Uh, I'm happy with the Y scale at the top there. I don't like where the Z scale ended up. I may have to do something about that. And that makes me wonder if positioning that in some kind of non-susceptible place is the reason that I got this with a broken ZDRO. It sort of sticks up there above the table and I couldn't even get a guard around it. The X-axis scale used to stick out the left-hand side of the machine near the hand wheels, if anyone recalls the uh, mill video. It's now centered under the table, much more tucked away and sort of invisible but it now protrudes forward of the vertical face of that x-axis slide. So if I were to take this table off, I'd have to be careful not to drop something else on that scale. So that may also be relocated sooner than later. Though I say that, and I bet these things will never move again until they break anyway. I found a new home for the oxyacetylene bottles and just put up some wood shelving. And I guess the point of this video is populating said wood shelving. Made a little draw bar hammer. That was kind of cute. That was just a, uh, I guess like a tube wrench. I cut one end off of, pressed some stainless steel through it and added a broomstick handle. And really I've just been drilling holes as I get either new or more tooling. It's all still to be organized. The whole not having a quill thing has been a bit of a pain in the backside, but I'm getting used to it. I'm really getting to know my speeds and feeds for my drills as all of the drilling happens with the power Z, sort of raising the table under power to drill. I think maybe the biggest letdown has been the loss of the ability to do power tapping. I've never used a tapping head, but maybe this is why they make them. I've been looking for a high speed head with the uh, quill, but that glean in my eye has been fading. I think I might just put that money into a nice beefy drill press and move all my hole drilling over to that. Anyway, back to the tool holders. What I had done with the original tool holder, with the first tool holder, was clamped it in a V-block, one of these things, butted this up against one of the jaws and was milling in from the outside with the intention of flipping the whole thing 180 degrees, doing the same thing on the other side and getting those notches, you know, exactly 180 degrees apart. But as you saw earlier, the other clamp uh, gave up the ghost and 
I damage that first tool holder. And since these slots are pretty much non-critical, I'm just going to hold them rock solid in the vise, mill them, and then just eyeball them 180 degrees. I'm close enough to the bottom where I think I should be able to see that milling slot and eyeball it with the base of the vise. All right, I just deburred a bit with a file, but I think that should do it. That's all of them cut. Let's go back to the lathe and cut the taper. So my top slide has been set up for this taper, you know, since I made the first sort of prototype tool holder. Now since then I've taken some really heavy cuts. So what I'm gonna do is put in my good tooling or the, the tooling I've been copying and just verify that the top slide is still set to cut that same taper. That nothing's moved basically. So that looks like it's still good. Nothing left to do but cut them. Now since I've got a hard shoulder here I don't want to run into, I'm going to advance my top slide all the way. And sort of set that to within, I don't know, 30 or 40 thou of that shoulder. And then lock down my carriage. This way I physically can't reach that shoulder, and since I'm going to be a few feet away on the other end of the drill, you know it's just a bit of insurance. All right, pretty much does it. If you want to see more detail on cutting and or setting up and cutting these tapers and now checking them, you can have a look at the lathe backplate video. The next step here will be to blue these and try them in the spindle in the mill. I won't show that here. Like I said, you could check the other video if you like. Once I tune these in, just deburr them a bit more. A couple of these get two set screws. Then they get blued and I call it a day. So the blue turned out relatively, I'd go far enough as to say okay. I think my Kool-Aid is maybe getting a little weak. There's a few sp faint spots. Maybe I didn't do a great job cleaning them up. Alright, so not a ton of tooling, but I think I got my bases covered for now. In the end, that 4150 was a little bit of a pain to work with. I'm going to have to look into that. Maybe there's some special inserts or I need coolant or I'm doing something wrong. But I think I'm going to keep my eye out for some more. And now that I've gotten this far, just make tooling that I need as it comes up. Drill more holes and add to the collection. Now I haven't tried the sling saw yet, and I'm curious how much run out I ended up with. These things always seem to wobble a bit no matter what you do, but I'm going to give this a try.